Good morning, everyone. Hello, and welcome to the U.S. Mission to Australia's virtual public engagement program, Diplomacy Delivered. My name is Doug Sonic, and I'm the economic counselor here at the U.S. Embassy in Canberra. The American Chamber of Commerce and Deloitte Access Economics recently re released a report that calculates that roughly 7% of Australia's GDP can be traced back to U.S. trade and investment. And that figure would not be possible without the culture of innovation and entrepreneurship that exists on both sides of the Pacific. This is a story that the U.S. mission in Australia is exploring through the podcast, 37 Degrees Latitude, hosted by U.S. Consul General to Melbourne, Mike Klein. Broadening and deepening the U.S. and Australian economic relationship is one of the top priorities for Ambassador Calva House and for the U.S. mission to Australia. And so we are delighted today to be exploring these issues with the very dynamic New York-based entrepreneur and angel investor, Peter Shankman. But first, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator today, Sophia Hamblin Wong. Sophia is the Chief Operating Officer of Mineral Carbonation International, an Australian initiative to transform carbon into building materials and industrial products. She is a technologist, a circular economy specialist, a science and business communicator, a University of Sydney Business School lecturer, member of the ACT Climate Change Council, and an alumna of the Global Entrepreneurship Summit. Sophia, I cannot think of a better person to be moderating today's discussion. Thank you for joining us, and over to you to introduce Peter Shankman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Douglas. So it's my pleasure, everybody, to uh, welcome Peter Shankman uh, to our audience. Uh, I'm just going to um, read a little bit from his bio, which is extremely impressive. He's an entrepreneur and corporate in-person person and digital keynote speaker, focusing on customer service and the new and emerging customer and neuroatypical economy. With three startup launches and exits under his belt, Peter is recognized worldwide for radically new ways of thinking about the customer experience, social media, PR, marketing, advertising, ADHD, and the new neurodiverse economy. Um, many of you may have all already seen him speak at US Embassy events because he, was, uh, he came to visit Australia a few years ago as well. He's the founder of Harrow, Help a Reporter Out. He has written a number of um, books, but Faster Than Normal is um, also his podcast, which is the internet's number one podcast on ADHD. And I highly recommend you check it out if you haven't already, because it's, it's excellent. Um, he is a worldwide influencer and spokesperson for brands across the globe. Current and past brands in, include Huawei, Specialized Bicycles, Scratch Labs, Sylvania Lighting, Thule, Scott Vest, and many others. And finally, this is my favorite part. Peter is a father. He's a two-time Ironman triathlete, a class B licensed skydiver, and has a pretty serious Peloton addiction. When he's not traveling around the world, interested to hear more about that today, um, keynoting to big companies and, and small ones too, he's based in New York City with his seven-year-old daughter and 19-year-old cat, both of whom consistently refuse to him access to the couch. So welcome, Peter. Um, I'll just in, um, invite Peter to um, give some remarks. And also, um, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention as well, I'm coming to you from the Ngunnawal lands, the lands of the Ngunnawal people, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Sophie. It's, it's great to be here. It's nice to be, quote unquote, back in Australia. Um, I tweeted out earlier that it is that, uh, uh, prepping for a keynote in, in Canberra um, from my kitchen in New York City as opposed to in Canberra is a little uh, dis disappointing. But either way, I am thrilled to be here and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to talk to you guys again. It's been about five years uh, since I was last in Australia uh, at the behest of the, of the US government. So it is, 
it is wonderful to be back and I, I appreciate uh, you having me back. It is a um, it is evening here in New York City at a cold night where we are supposed to be indoors and, and most of us are. Um, we are still, uh, still, still fighting with a handful of people to wear their masks, but we're doing the best we can here. And uh, fortunately the schools are still open. And so, uh, so my, 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 my seven-year-old still gets to go to the school every day. Uh, it's, it's, it's an, we're, we're in interesting times. There's no question about it. But the thing about interesting times is that the interesting times tend to lend themselves to the best creativity uh, that we see. You know, if you look at any, <clears throat> any major company that has ever started and sort of taken over the world, uh, they started usually during interesting times. Um, Amazon started uh, at the end of a recession. Um, uh, if you go further back, so did Microsoft. <clears throat> if you look at things like Uber and uh, Airbnb, uh, even Facebook, they all started uh, some in the 05 recession, some in the, in the 2010 recession. So, so, you know, it is said that uh, interesting times are the best time in the world to, to start a company and to be an entrepreneur. And I, I find that pretty ridiculously true, even though the past eight months I've gone from traveling about a quarter million or 300,000 miles a year to a full stop uh, in my living room, which is, uh, as I look around in a New York City apartment, is, is a decent size, but you spend seven or eight months here nonstop and it, it gets a little small. Definitely. Uh, so, Peter, I actually um, listened to all of your podcast interviews uh, in ah. preparation for this. Uh, so, <laughs> um, I have just. That. That's a long. That's a lot of. That's a lot of time. <laughs> You're a very impressive person, and uh, you know it's really. Yeah, you've got a lot of really good insights. So, I'm I'm interested to hear quite a lot about um, your work and everything. But I did want to ask about. Um, I heard you um, say in an interview that you, in order to create the right work routines and um, yeah, the right systems in your life that you had a, a separate place that you may go to work in New York that was away from your daughter um, and away from your home life. And how is that working during COVID? Do you? So it's been very interesting. You know, when we look back, I, I was talking to a friend of mine earlier today about this. You know, March 8th was the last flight I took. Uh, I, I've since gone, I've since traveled. I traveled about a month ago, I went to Dubai and it was uh, actually, I felt safer on the plane than anywhere else. But um, prior to that, it was, it was March 8th. I landed from a keynote in Las Vegas and had I, had I known that was my, gonna be my last trip, I probably would spend a few more minutes on the plane. But um, you know, the city did not really shut down. I guess the best way to put it is we didn't shut down in, in New York City until we actually did. Right, I remember the 8th was a Sunday of March, the 9th, 10th, 11th, Wednesday the 11th, I was invited to an 8 a.m. media preview spin class uh, at Peloton's new studios, right? So they just launched a $75 million studio. I remember I went there and the, the media was there and I was there and we had a great spin class and, and it was over by 9 a.m. and by 9.15, the city started shutting down. Uh, they were supposed to have another media preview at 11, which was canceled. And by 5 p.m., schools were closed and we were home. And it was just sort of this, you know, full stop, right? Imagine a, a submarine, uh, Hunter in October, it goes 50 miles away, full stop, you know, full stop by, and we just, we just shut down. Um, that being said, I put sort of rules into place that allowed me to keep working as best I could. Um, you know, being a single father, um, her mom is, is, is still very, you know, we're, we're, we're 50, 50 split. It, it works really well, but you know, her, I have a, a little more of a flexible schedule than she does. And so I was pretty much doing a lot of the homeschooling, most of the homeschooling. And so I would get up, I already got up super early to exercise to, to keep my ADHD under, under, you know, in check. I'd get up even earlier and I'd exercise first and I'd, I'd, you know, I'd sit down at my computer like around four, four fifteen AM after having gotten up at three and worked out and taken a shower and I'd work hard from like four. 4.15 to about, you know, 6.30, 7 o'clock. And I'd get all the busy work out of the way, all the stuff that I, you know, that I didn't want to have to do, which was the same stuff I would have done in my office. Then I got my daughter up, you know, we'd have breakfast. I'd sit her in front of Zoom, uh, you know, which would usually last about 20 minutes before she'd inadvertently shut the computer off or, or do something like that. You know, uh, I think the, the, the biggest thing I learned was that, um, <laughs> was that all her teachers have lied to me. She is, in fact, not a pleasure to have in class. But it was a... Uh, 
it was it was a new experience. But what I found is that a lot of people, I talked to thousands of people about this. I would host live Zooms and live events and you know for other entrepreneurs. And we found out that it is pretty amazing what the human spirit can do when given no other choice, right? And we have seen that over and over and over and over and over again over the past eight or nine months uh, all around the world. Um, you know, we were all in a state of shock for a few weeks and then, and then we just sort of started waking up and say, okay, this is how it's going to be. And here's how I'm going to do this and I'm going to make it work. And, you know, it's not for, I speak primarily about entrepreneurs, right? It has been a very difficult economic time for people all over the world. Um, entrepreneurs, we have it a little, I want to say easier because it's a lot harder, but we have things going for us that people who work in other situations don't in the respect that we can pivot on a dime any way we need to, right? All my keynotes, I had, I had 14 trips between March and June, um, all of which were canceled, but three fourths of which still took place virtually. And I was able to pivot to that. And so the key for any entrepreneur anytime, but especially in a crisis situation like this is to be able to flexibly pivot and to be able to say, okay, A to B to C no longer works. So we're going to go A to D to M and then back to R. And, and, and the beauty of that is that at this point, no one cares. No one cares where you're working from. I'm, I'm, I'm literally, my cat's water bowl and food dish is right here. Right. We, the, the joke is that we have seen the inside of so many of our coworkers homes that we would never otherwise see. And who cares? The end result, I think a lot of barriers have broken down over the past eight or nine months. And for entrepreneurs, that's an amazing moment. Everything from, do I need an office to do my employees have to be local? We're going to see things that, that we used to dream about. I remember when I started my first company in 1998, First thing I had to do was come up with 10 grand to, when I wanted to hire someone because I had to find an office. Never again. <laughs> no way. Never again. We're absolutely finding that too in Australia. Um, I, I've, I've been working from home for uh, since I started working with Mineral Carbonation International. So it's been seven years of being um, just flex, flexible. And um, now I'm not as embarrassed to take my calls and also be weeding my garden. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, the thing is that, you know, I, I joke that, that um, as long as we're talking and we have a connection, you know, you don't need to know where I am. I, I, I have friends who, who uh, when this kicked off, they said, okay, we're out of here. And they went to Bali and they went to, um, you know, a, a friend of mine is, is in, has been in um, the Maldives for seven months. I mean, I had, I had to eventually say, if you send me one more picture of you on the, on the beach, I'm gonna beat the crap out of you. But you know, at the end of the day, he's able to go, he has a, an area of his bungalow, right? Where he, he, he put a photo behind him of what looks like his, his view from his window in New York. <laughs> he just works. We really, we really have changed. And, and it's fascinating to see how you have so many companies who are afraid of this happening and all of a sudden they're seeing, okay, we didn't explode. The universe didn't blow up. You mean we don't have to pay for 75,000 square feet of real estate on 45th street and fifth Avenue. Huh? That could add to our bottom line, you know, and it was, it's just fascinating to watch all these, these, these CFOs and these, and these CEOs sort of have that moment of clarity where they're like, wow, this could actually be something here where five years ago, if you had told them that, 78%, 85% of their workforce is going to be working from home or from wherever. They never would have believed it. And do you have any predictions for that for the United States about which cities are going to experience exodus and which will retain? So New York City has lost about 10% of its renters. It has lost surprisingly little of its home purchasers. The people that own apartments here like myself we're not going anywhere. The beauty of New York and other major cities is that even when the real estate market goes to hell, prices don't really, sale prices don't really go down. They just sort of stay flat, right? So that means they'll go up again. You can't build more land in New York. So it's not a question of if it's going to come back. It's a question of when. I'm predicting we will be back to quote unquote normal 
in, in, in three to four years. But normal, when I say that, I mean normal in terms of like, you know, my elevators will be full when I get in them as opposed to right now there being me in them, you know. Um, we're going to have to wait, though, to see what else is going to happen because, you know, right now I, I live on the, on the west side of Manhattan and the west side of Manhattan is primarily uh, residential, right? If you walk three blocks east, east towards Broadway and 7th Avenue and 6th Avenue and 5th Avenue and Madison and Park, then you have... Uh, commercial real estate, you know, so you'd walk from your apartment on 42nd and 9th to your office on 42nd and 6th or 34th and 7th, whatever. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of rezoning because if you have a building w that used to have like, like one Penn Plaza, which is a 55 story um, office tower right above Penn Station. So everyone who commutes in from Long Island, New Jersey, they go in the elevators, they get to their office. They're at 3% capacity right now. They have 3% of, of the people who have leases in those offices actually going in. So if that's what we're looking at, and we don't see that improving anytime soon, the question becomes, what happens to those spaces? Well, just like we saw all the factories in Brooklyn, 20, you know, that used to be there 70, 80 years ago, that baked bread and made all this. Now that we're seeing those turn to, um, you know, lofts and warehouse living and things like that. I think it's gonna be pretty interesting. I think it's a pretty bad time to be commercial real estate, but I think it's a phenomenal time to be residential real estate. The next few years are gonna be really, really interesting. Yeah, now that so many people are um, working from home or living at work. Well, I mean, I, it's, I say that if I had, if I didn't have, I mean, my parents live three blocks from me, right? And they're in there, they're turning 80 this year. My daughter's here, my daughter's seven years old, right? So I'm, I'm in this apartment for at least the next 11 years, right? But <laughs> The joke being that if I didn't have a daughter and my parents weren't there, I'd probably be in Asia, Australia, who knows? I'd, 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 I'd be mobile. I'd be a lot more mobile because we have that ability. And I think that what's happening now is it used to just be a small subsection of entrepreneurs who had that ability. And now we're seeing that very much expand. So if you're looking at starting a company or, or creating something, ask yourself if you're in that position where you're trying to save every dollar and not, you know, and spend as little as possible. Ask yourself, do you need to start it and be where you currently are? Or is there somewhere you could go to save a bunch of that money? Mm, that's, that's really insightful. I found that um, I was in New York in February. So um, in the middle of middle of February, I was a guest of McKinsey up at their headquarters. And that was... COVID was in New York then. We knew about the virus, but we weren't, we didn't know the extent of it. Obviously no lockdown had happened. Just before that, I was in Davos in the beginning of, uh, middle of January, end of January. And that was right when they, all, they were just about to um, call it a pandemic or, um, or elevated status. And I remember thinking, um, oh, I, I travel so much. I'm I'm based in Australia. It's so difficult to be in uh, at top of mind for um, new technologies if you're not invited into forums. If you're not uh, engaging in the critical discussions when people make decisions, and so um, traveling was such an important part of our business's growth, particularly because it's a whole new technology area. Um, and I thought, oh my gosh, what's this going to mean? Um, I'm in New York right now. If the world gets cut off, will Australia be isolated? And it's actually not been that way at all. We've had, just like you were saying, I equally have had more than 10 um, international conferences that I didn't have to spend 30 oh, yeah. hours each way. <laughs> and you know, the other thing is for me as a keynote, I've been able to call these clients and say, okay, I'm still going to speak. You're still going to pay me my regular fee, but I'm going to save you 10 grand in travel costs. Still, so yep. the bargain. <laughs> I'm like, all I have to do is put on a shirt. You know, it's like, it really is a game changer. And, and again, what's so fascinating about that from what you said is that, you know, you were saying that, that you felt like you were, gonna, you were afraid you're going to be locked out being there in Australia. We're all locked out, right? We're all locked out, which allows us to be, completely in in some strange way we're more in than we are out because we're out right? it's like a bad seinfeld episode right i was out now i'm here now i'm there but that's exactly where you are right now yep 
that's yeah that's very true so i feel more connected than ever uh and i think this is a, a great i guess a great segue into some of the questions that have been uh, sent in from some of our audience so we'll um we'll run this in a bit of a free form way uh just to I wanna, let I everyone... add, uh, for anyone who's uh, uh i'm on the socials i'm at peter shankman on all the networks and i encourage you uh you know if you don't if you get to your question or whatever Follow me, tweet me, Instagram me, whatever, at Peter Shankman. I'd love to keep the conversation going after our, our event ends. So please feel free to join me. Absolutely. And also feel free to um, drop some questions into the Q&A and we'll um, try our best to get to all of them. And any that we don't get to, the embassy will endeavor and I will also endeavor to um, ensure that they're answered offline. Um, so... That's also a segue into the fact that we're trying a, a new thing. We're going to do some polling today. Um, so let's give it a red hot crack. Um, our first poll will be open for, the fir for five minutes. And um, the question is, how confident do you feel in launching a business venture in the current economic environment? So I'm, I'm very confident and I'm, I'm more confident. I have some concerns, and I'm not confident. I'll let um, I'll leave that open and uh, allow people to take some time, and we'll obviously learn as we go if there are any um, any issues. Um, so, Peter, um, I was one of the questions that was submitted is, um, what are the top ways that SMEs can build momentum and continue to grow post COVID nineteen? I think one of the keys is to stop looking at sort of like, you know, first of all, I hate the term the new normal. I hate that term. I, I, I was first introduced that term back in 2008 when my grandmother passed away. My, uh, my mother's uh, cleaning woman said, oh, it's a new normal. I said, no, it's not. Grandma's grandma's here. Grandma's not here. There's nothing normal about that. You know, so it's, it's the premise that whenever we get into a new normal, something else happens, right? So it's just, it's just new. It's always new. And that's exciting. One of the keys that we have to understand is that we have, again, we are in a great position right now. You know, I am, if I were starting a new company right now, I would be so psyched to be starting it right now um, on the basic premise that, <laughs> think about, I don't know the best way to describe this. Think about a, you're driving on the highway and you see a massive car wreck on the other side, right? Like 20 cars and they've all been, you know, maybe it was a snowstorm, whatever, and then 20, 30 cars all crash into each other. You're not gonna look at one car and say, oh my God, look at how badly that car, you should look at all the cars and say, wow, what a wreck. We're in a position right now where the entire world is getting wrecked. And so now is the perfect time to start a business. What's the worst possible thing that can happen? You fail and you start something new. But there's nothing holding you back right now. Ten, people tend to get complacent when things are going well. Right? You know, oh, I have a good job. I have a salary. I don't really need to do anything and make a difference right now. Things are, seem to be going pretty well. I'll just sort of, you know, keep it going. Well, complacency leads to stagnation. The problem with stagnation is that when you get fired or when something happens, you're kind of lost and you don't really know where to go. Now we're all in this, oh my God, what's next? I don't know what's next. So if, since I don't know what's going on anyway, might as well start a business. Right? Again, what's the worst that can happen? It fails and you go find a job. Well, you were unemployed anyway because of COVID, so what have you got to lose? That's so true. That's, it's sad. If you're the, I'm looking at the poll numbers and, 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 and they seem to echo that sentiment. 31% yeah. I'm very confident, 38% I'm more confident. Yes, I mean, it seems to be, you know, along those lines. Hmm. I guess, that, yeah, I didn't really think of it like that. I guess there is less at stake if you fail, if, um, if there's more unemployment. Well, plus, you know, one of the things that we have to accept is that from an experiential point of view, the bar has really been lowered, right? Not only, I mean, think about back when you used to be able to fly, you know, we, at least in the US, you get to the airport three hours early because, you know, you're supposed to, and you pick the, 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 the TSA line with the shortest, shortest length and, and you get on, it's, it's going fine until they get up to you. And for some reason, you're pulled into a private room and examined. And you know, and now you're, now you're late to catch your flight and you run to the gate and you're there, but they moved your gate. Now you have to run across the airport. You've had many strokes. You know, I asked people what, who had a great flight and one person raised their hand and said, what made it great? So we took off on time and landed on time. I'm like, okay, that's just called a flight. So if the bar is that low to begin with, I don't need you to be awesome. And the bar's gotten even lower with everything that's been going on in our world, right? We're, we're, we're a world that's somehow politicized 
masks. If the bar is that low, I don't need you to be awesome. I just need you to be slightly better than everyone else and not by a lot. So now is the perfect time, the perfect time to start a new company, start a new venture. So you visited Australia a few years ago, as we mentioned, and uh, I see that Peter Adamek is on uh, on the oh, line. Be- yeah, so I'm um, chair. I'm um, the CEO of the Canberra Innovation Network. Um, so, do you, what can Australians learn from US startup culture, and what can Americans learn from Australian startup culture? Do you have some insights there? I can give you the first part. Is is you know the move fast and break things mentality does tend to work. One of the nice things about having attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD is that when I decide to do something, I don't really think twice about it. I pretty much just go and do it. Um, I joke that I have two speeds. I have namaste and I'll cut someone. And there's no sort of middle ground there. And so if I'm I've heard you in a different way. <laughs> yeah, I just have to be nice because it's a State Department you know, <laughs> function. I, I, didn't, I didn't want someone showing up at my house. But um, the premise that, you know, if, 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 I'm, if I have an idea, I'm going for it right? And I'll either succeed or I'll crash on the wall at 100 miles an hour, but either way I've learned something. And I think that that prevalent in, in successful startups and that people understand, okay, you have to move fast and it's okay to screw up. It's okay to make mistakes. Have fun with it, right? Worst thing that can happen, you fail and you do something else. Um, I think that the key is to find people to work with who are very good at the thing you're not, right? I am well aware that my ability to schedule things is terrible. Um, about 10 years ago, I've had the same assistant for about 12 years. About 10 years ago, she took right access away from me uh, to my calendar because I booked two dinners on the same night. And when she told me, she said, I'm like, that was, that was a little bit of overkill. You didn't really, it was only two dinners. And she, you know, you booked them on separate continents. So you're, you're done. And I haven't had access to my calendar. I haven't been able to write my own calendar for 12 years. And that's fine because I know what I'm good at. And that's not one of those things. I'm here with you right now on time because Megan put it into my calendar, right? So one of the key things, and I think this applies across the board in Australia as well, is you need to understand that you are great at certain things, but you are not great at everything. And it's very important to make sure that the things you're not great at, you have other people surrounding you who are. You're, yeah, I've definitely found that outsourcing the things in my life that I'm not good at has freed up an unbelievable amount of um, mental space. One of the things I love about, one of the things I love about um, Australia, I have have friends there and I have friends in Australia who are in my mastermind network at all as well. And it's great to be able to to, uh, talk to them right before I go to sleep and wake up and have an answer, right? Because, you know, 14 hours ahead or whatever. So, you know, surround yourself with people who give you everything that you need in that regard. Yeah, so um, that actually links me to a a question by Adam Mostegal from um, Tasmania, who um, asked a question about um, what groups and organizations should we be learning from in Australia and who could we be connecting with from a US Australia perspective? Um, that work in the space for cross-cultural links. Uh, I thought it might be a good opportunity for you to also talk about um, sh- your Shank Minds network and yeah. um, what led you to, to start that. So I run a mastermind called Shank Minds. We're, we're an accountability and networking group of about 100 people. And uh, it's at shankminds.com. And the basic premise is we're a Slack group that occasionally has meetings in the respect that when you're an entrepreneur, you're pretty much working on your own. Right. And when you're working on your own, you have to sort of figure out, okay, what do I do to keep myself accountable? Right. The biggest problem I have when I first started my company 22 years ago is I felt like I wasn't working. Right. I felt like I was doing anything but what I'd be, you know, even though I was working, I'd be sitting in my apartment in my bed and I'd hear my neighbors down the hall going to work. And I felt unemployed, even though I was working. It took a long, long time. And so a lot of times when you're an entrepreneur and you're starting your own thing, you're doing your own thing, you have to be very aware of what you're doing and how you're uh, keeping yourself accountable. And so the the best thing that I have for uh, advice for that is find a group of people who are somewhat like you, also not like you. Because 
the ones who are not like you are going to uh, push back against your BS, right? If you, you know, in my group, if I say, guys, I need a favor, I need to get this project done by Friday, someone remind me on Wednesday to get on Thursday, right? If I'm still getting texts at 8 a.m. Wednesday, going, how's it going? And if I don't respond, they'll call me, hey, how are you doing with this? Because they know me, right? And they know that sometimes you need that little burst. So the key is really to figure out who can do that. Um, and whether it's a group in Australia or in America, there are, count, for me, accountability comes in, on, in, in many forms, but the best form is people that I can trust. Um, so I, I run this group, and again, I'm not pitching my group, you know, you can find someone that, that you prefer. Um, I have a couple of people um, uh, who live on the Sunshine Coast right now um, and uh, in, in my group, and, and they're wonderful because it's something completely different for me. They, 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 they run an online yoga and Pilates uh, studio. Right, but they are uh, really, really good at marketing, and they're good at, at creating, um, creating um, uh, 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 um, online classes and lessons and things like that. And I'm learning so much from these girls. There's two kids in there. I want to say they're late twenties, and I'm learning so much from them because they just know about things that I don't. Right? Everyone you meet is is an expert in something that you're not, and vice versa. Right? So surround yourself with people who are like you in the respect they have the same passion and drive but are completely different in that they know stuff that you don't and learn from them. I, I so connect with that because uh, I think that so often we know that mentorship within entrepreneurship is so important. And uh, also that being mentored by one person probably isn't enough, but you know, having three is, is great. And also acknowledging that the mentorship relationship is two ways there's never a time that it's just one person teaching another person everything. You always have something to offer another person who is teaching you. And seeing um, those relationships as reciprocal, um, I think is just, it, it allows you to get more out of life. I would um, suggest also that in addition to, you, you want to do two things. You want to learn everything you can and you want to teach everything you know. Because the people that, one of the best quotes I ever heard actually came out of a mastermind group I was in in Bangkok in 2013. And it probably the one line I wrote down from two days of, of masterminding was this, um, people with resources tend to distribute opportunities to people they trust. So your job is not only that, to, to learn, but to help people and let these people beca become people that trust you. Because once they trust you, they will work with you, right? It, it, it's, it's, you know, I, I teach this all the time when I, when I teach companies about customer experience, customer service. No one believes how great you are if you're the one that has to tell them. But if you've been doing amazing things and helping people and offering advice and, and, and not looking to sell something, but looking to say, how can I help? You would be amazed at the response that you get when, you, when they do have something they need your help for. That's something that quite that I connected with when um, learning about shank mines is that it's not based upon an elitist structure either. It's open to everybody. Um, I think that we um, in the world, we can be creating our own groups like that. Um, and probably it'd be interesting to learn a little bit more about how you started off, uh, started up offline. Um, I, sorry, did you want to say something? No, go ahead. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I just think also that um, quite often in Australia, we, we've looked to the US as a place to learn and to look up to with regard to entrepreneurship and innovation over the past, certainly decade, but decades, because a lot of the world's best and most successful companies have come out of the US. But I think uh, more and more Australia has something to teach the US. And I'm not sure if you have any comments about the sentiment within the US about whether that, um, yeah, whether that's a, something to consider. I think that at the end of the day, people who change the world are usually the ones who believe they can. And the downside is that there is still a very, very strong mentality in America and beyond 
I believe in Australia as well as, you know, keep your head down, do your work. Don't make any big noises, right? Don't attract attention to yourself. Well, as someone with ADHD, that obviously was never going to be me, right? <laughs> and, and I paid a very heavy price for that growing up. School was horrible. School was very difficult for me and things like that. But as I grew up, I realized that it's not so much about making loud noises. It's about if you have something valuable to offer and something valuable to say, that's when you want to talk, right? In Australia. That the more you keep your mouth shut and listen to other people, the more they'll tell you exactly what you need to know. You know, when I get on a plane, if you're sitting next to me on a plane, unless you fake your own death, I'm going to know everything about you by the time we land. Now, I didn't say that you're going to know everything about me. I said, I'm going to know everything about you because I'm going to introduce myself and then let you talk. Most people in the world, they talk, they listen just long enough to, to, to let the other person take a breath of air and then they start talking, right? If you just listen, it is amazing what you can learn. Some of the most valuable information I ever got in my life would be would, came from standing outside the gym at 5.15 in the morning, waiting for it to open, listening to other CEOs, you know, just listening. And, and, and <laughs> I had a girlfriend, I'll never forget this, I had a girlfriend once uh, from the South. Uh, she, she, was, she was from New York, but her mother was born and raised in the South of, uh, of, of the United States and had the accent and, and would always say something sweet, but you knew it was an insult, but she'd say it sweetly. And I remember I was saying something at a holiday party once and she interrupted me. She goes, you know, you know, you know, Suge, that was her big thing. She called everyone Suge. You know, Suge, the good Lord gave us, what did she say? The good Lord gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason so we could listen twice as much as we talk, right? I mean, it was the, it was the rudest freaking thing she ever could have said to me, but it was, it was, to this day, I'm very, very thankful I listened to that because that's some valuable insight right there. Wow. Uh, so I think in Australia, um, we have this thing called the tall poppy syndrome. So I think we're yep. very, we're not that inclined to want to make big ambitious statements about our, uh, um, about our ambitions to lead and rule uh, in quite as much fervor as perhaps America has. Um, and whether or not that's a bad thing, I think is... Um, I, I think humility is a good thing, but it's also very, um, there's a lot of strength to be able to um, speak about um, the things that you're good at. And I think well, I'd when... argue there's a difference between humility and knowing when to talk, right? It's great <laughs> to be humble, right? But on the flip side, you know, what's the line? I'm humble until such time when I actually have something that you need to hear, mm. right? So, you know, I, I have no problem being quiet and letting other people talk, but damn it, if I know I'm right, you're going to hear it. <laughs> right. So I, that, that leads me into a question from Alan, so, who, um, who asked, are investors just obsessed with the tech unicorn? Um, and what about innovation startups, particularly in the fast moving consumer goods space? Now, I, I know Alan, so I, I think I'll, I'll just provide a little bit of context. Um, he is the co-founder of a, um, a company called Altina Drinks, which is a zero proof, no alcohol cocktails, which provide really interesting drinks um, for people who aren't drinking alcohol, which wow. I'm sure you would um, identify with because I know that you've recently given up alcohol. Um, and there aren't I very many. Like that over here. Cause, yeah, right now I'm pretty much, I'm subsisting on Club soda, and then um, uh, uh, what's that? What there's a brand of seltzer. Um, I'm totally spacing Picari on the name right sweat? Now, No, it's a, it's a U.S. brand of seltzer, but essentially, it's it's like it's like drinking what I it's like what I imagine drinking TV static would be like. So yeah, I would welcome something with with uh, with zero zero proof that 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 tasted good. But I I will say this to, to answer his question: there is a very large. A segment of society, a CPG and otherwise, that is still very much looking to invest. Um, you know, uh, back in January, Peloton went public and everyone said, okay, it's a damn bicycle, right? It's a, it's a, it's a bike that, you know, what the hell is the point? And of course, COVID hit, you know, and they're up 238% on the year. Um, a good idea does not have to be tech-based. Not everything needs to be connected to the internet. I'm not saying not everything will be. I mean, I can turn on and off my lights, my, my, my heat, my air conditioning, my windows, my shades, 
everything with my voice. But on the flip side, you know, give me a bottle of seltzer that doesn't taste like TV static and I will invest the crap out of that. So, you know, th there, is, there is a huge market, especially post COVID, right? People have surprisingly been saving, at least in America, we've been saving a lot of money, right? I mean, I, my, my Amex bill, my God, the first two months after COVID dropped and, you know, all of a sudden I'm getting all these refunds and all these flights. And I, I had a negative $25,000 Amex bill that I didn't, you know, negative 20 because I wasn't going anywhere. And so I think that people are saving money and there's going to be a huge influx of capital. So yeah, if you have a, if you have a wonderful idea that is not necessarily tech-based, I'd love to hear it. And I know a lot of other people that I know would love to hear it as well. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, and now a question from Peter Adamek. So, um, which is um, right up your alley. What is your best advice to people who think about entrepreneurship, but are worried that they have some personal barrier, such as ADHD, that oh. is a big disadvantage? What would you suggest they need to think, focus on and do? Well, I never pimp out my book, but I'm totally gonna pimp out my book. Faster Than Normal is a bestseller that was entirely written on the premise that ADHD is a gift, not a curse. I believe that all three of the businesses I've started that have since been acquired have done so because of, not in spite of, my ADHD. My ADHD has allowed me to come up with ideas, has allowed me to work 10 times the speed of light, but you have to put rules into play to let yourself take advantage of those. The best advice I can give you is that it is not a curse, it is a gift as long as you know how to use it. If you're used to driving a Honda Accord all your life or a Kia Sport or whatever, um, and someone gives you the gift of a Lamborghini, you're not gonna sit there and go, oh, this is a curse. No, you're gonna be like, holy crap, it's a Lamborghini. But if you're used to having to floor the, Lamb the, having to floor the, the Honda to get onto the highway, and all of a sudden you floor the Lamborghini, you're gonna be in a tree. You have to learn how to drive. A, 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 a neurodiverse brain is simply a different brain. You have to learn how to drive it differently. So I am all for entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial uh, 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 lifestyles when you have a neurodiverse brain or lifestyle, but you just, again, you have to understand how to use it. You know, there's a, my daughter goes to, it's around 7.45 right, uh, New York right now, p.m. My daughter goes to bed around 8 p.m. I'm usually out by 8.30 p.m. Um, you know, everyone's like, oh my God, what does that mean you get up early? I'm like, yeah, I'm usually up at about 3, 3.30, quarter to four in the morning. And everyone's like, my God, are you a farmer? I go, no, but this is, you know, again, I get that workout in, which gives me the dopamine I need. You put rules into place that allow you to live your life the best way you want. Um, you know, my closet is labeled. It literally has, it has two sides to it. it, it, it they're labeled, it says office slash travel and it's t-shirts and jeans. And it says uh, speaking slash TV and it's button down shirts, jackets and jeans, that's it. My suits, my vests, my sweaters, those are all in another closet in my daughter's room because if I had to go in there every day, I'd go, wait, what should I wear? That sweater, I remember that sweater. Laura gave me that sweater, I should look her up. It's three hours later, I'm naked in the living room on Facebook, I haven't left the house. So you need to set rules when you have a different brain, you have a neurodiverse brain, you need to set rules that allow you to live your best life and focus the best way possible. It is very doable and I encourage anyone with that kind of neurodiversity in their lives to, to act on it, to use it. It is certainly not, not a negative. And some studies that we've done, because one of the things I do is I consult to companies on how to uh, hire and sell to neurodiverse brains, which some people say are gonna be 15 to 20% of, um, of, of, of the economy in the next 20 years. Um, one of the things to understand is that companies are desperately looking to hire neurodiverse because they're the most creative people in the world. You want to have that creativity in your office. So I, I connected with some of your themes as well when you were um, talking about the, the different ways that you learned that your brain works and particularly with regard to uh, having deadlines, um, which is really difficult in entrepreneurship when you're effectively running teams. Um, but that's again, that's where a good accountability group comes in. I tell right. every client I have, Hey, if you need something from me, don't just say, oh yeah, get it to me whenever you can. Because here's the tip, you won't get it. If you say get it to you when you can, it becomes the most important thing until the next person gives me an assignment and then that becomes the most important thing. So if you have something on deadline, if you have something you need done, set a deadline for it. You know, tell your clients, whoever, hey, give me a deadline. Say you need this by Thursday at 4 p.m. I have a, a, I'm doing a keynote for Adobe um, in two weeks. And I thought it was gonna be live. 
And they actually called today and said, hey, can you, can you record, can you pre-record? I said, sure, no problem. And they, um, the person in charge knows me and she knows how my brain works. She says, great, get it to me by Tuesday of next week. I'm like, oh, but you're not gonna need it until she's like, get it to me by Tuesday of next week. Cause she knows that otherwise my 8 a.m. speech at 4 a.m. I'll be up pre-recording that thing, right? So let's get it done early. So yeah, make sure you set deadlines and have that accountability. Tell someone. Um, there's an animal rescue society called Best Friends Animal Society in the United States. And they are a recipient of probably some decent money every year between me and all my friends because every time we have something to get done, we put 50 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever into a pot. If we don't get it done by the time we say we do it, that money goes to the best friends. So, you know, our, our, our ADHD brains have probably saved some animal lives. <laughs> I've definitely implemented that within my team as well. Just um, asking them to make me more accountable for when I'll, um, I'll have things done. But um, I, would you mind to tell the story about how you wrote your book? So faster than normal, I had a six month or a seven, eight month deadline on it. I did all the research the very first few weeks. So that's what you do ADHD. Like, Oh, just start working. And then I forgot about it, you know, for like seven and a half months. And then a, a publisher called and said, hey, you know, how's the book coming? It's doing two weeks. I'm like, oh, no problem. And I, I bought a round trip flight to ticket to Tokyo, leaving the next day from New York. I, I took the, 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 the train to the airport, the subway to the airport. I got to New York airport with my laptop, power cord, a sweatshirt, my headphones. I got on the plane. I, I wrote chapters one through five on the flight to Asia. Landed in Tokyo, went to the lounge had a cup of coffee, took a shower, got back on the same plane, same seat, two hours later, and flew back to New York and wrote chapters six through 10. And then I got held up by Department of Homeland Security for six hours because I never actually cleared immigration in Japan, but I had a book. And the funny part was they actually called my publisher to confirm that I was writing a book and I wasn't like you know, smuggling something. And so my publisher's like, yeah, yeah, he's writing a book. And then she called me an hour later. She's like, so when you said you had the book done, like that was a lie, but here it is. You know? <laughs> so, but no, but, but you know, and again, when you're an entrepreneur, when you have a different brain, you, you don't care. I don't care what other people think. People are like, oh my God, what the hell's wrong with you? You spent $5,000 to go nowhere. No, I spent $5,000 to write a book. By the way, it was a bestseller. What do you care how I did it? Absolutely. And I think that seeing that as some kind of just a feature of your brain is, is, you know, it, it really changed the way that I think about the way that I work. So I really thank you uh, for that story. Well, well, just think of my carbon emissions, catch the train. It was, the flight was going to Asia, whether it was on it or not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've got um, another question from uh, Tara McClelland. Uh, and so uh, she asks, on one hand, it seems that there are so many opportunities at the moment for young people to create and thrive. But what do you say to young people who feel overwhelmed by things like social media and all the bad things that come from that? Uh, four months ago, I quit Facebook. I didn't quit in the respect that I canceled my account. My account's still there. I might check it to read my, my, um, my memories to see what I did 10 years ago, because that's always fun. But I don't engage anymore. I don't engage on it. I don't, and oh my God, it feels like I've lost 50 pounds. And obviously looking at me, you can tell I haven't, but it really does, I really do feel like, like a new person because I don't have to. The problem with social media, the benefit of social media is that anyone can get on it. The problem is that anyone can get on it. And you get on the social, your brain actually, every time you get a ding, every time you get a notification, every time you get a Slack update, a tweet, an Instagram like, your brain actually releases dopamine. It's a, it's, a, it's a feedback loop. There's a reason that everyone knows, everyone knows texting and driving is bad and it can kill you. There's a reason people still do it because they get a ding on their phone, ooh. So, you know, for me, shutting off, I have no alerts. I, I control my phone, I don't let my phone control me. The best advice I can give you, stop caring about what people who don't care whether you live or die, think about you, right? Don't give, don't let people live in your head rent free. And everyone on social media will want to live in your head. Because here's the thing, anything you do, any company you start, whatever, there are going to be so many haters because haters fear change. Haters enjoy the status quo. 
And if you're an entrepreneur, you're changing things, usually for the better. And there are gonna be people who are afraid of that. Don't sit there and listen to them. Don't give them the time of day. I used to be like that. I used to get, you know, I'd, 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 I'd do something, I'd get 20,000 comments, all positive, and then one negative comment. Which one do you think I listen to for the rest of the day in my brain, right? You gotta let that go. At the end of the day, you gotta let that go. You have to be focused on what you're doing and how you're doing it. If you have a belief that you can change the world and make things better, follow that. End of story. I think that, uh, I can't remember the exact quote, but Brene Brown uh, said something like, unless you've nailed it and mastered the exact thing that I'm doing, I'm not listening to your criticism. Yep. I love that. And that's the thing, you know, you want to listen to what people say, but there's a difference between listening to what people say and then, and then taking to heart comments from idiots. Yeah. I, you know, I've struggled like, with that, I have to say. It's, people I, are very courageous just, online. <laughs> that's the thing, right? We call them microphone gangsters. Right? You get you see them in person, they're not gonna talk shit to you. You see, you know, they do that, they do that on 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 from behind a computer. Yeah. I, I think as well it's they're all designed to make you addicted and to keep you oh, no question that. So no question all of that. This. very much um again, that's why when you get that ding, your body actually releases dopamine and dopamine is the pleasure chemical. It's why people take cocaine, right? There's no, there's a very slight difference between getting a, a like and doing drugs. You want to make sure you're not there. Shut the phone. The other thing, when you go to sleep, shut the phone off. Don't just silence it, shut it off. In my 22 years of being an entrepreneur, one time did a client need me for a legitimate reason at three in the morning. Other than that, it's never happened. Shut off your phone. One time in 22 years is not the end of the day, not the end of the world. Absolutely. So we've just had a question come in from uh, Billy McCarthy Price, who says, what specific skill sets should young people who aren't from a business or entrepreneurial background develop to increase their odds of being successful when establishing ventures? Particularly those who might have identified an issue as a result of work, volunteering, or social justice that they want to impact? That's a great question. Great I question. think the first and foremost thing is become a better listener. Understand how to, how, to, how to recognize your audience. Understand that what you think is a great idea needs to be validated by your audience, by the people who will buy it, or the people who will use it, or the people who will benefit from it. Everyone thinks when they're starting a company that they control the direction of that company. Sorry, the cat. Everyone thinks that, that, that uh, the person starting the company, that you control the direction of your company, you don't. The company, the direction of your company is controlled by your audience, controlled by your customers. Um, having an audience, having customers is a privilege. It's not a right, right? If you want to have an audience and you want to have customers, that is a privilege that you have to earn every day by creating good content, by creating things that they want and giving them what they want the way they want, right? You might have the greatest content in the world, but if you're giving to them via Twitter and they're not on Twitter, that's a waste of time. Where is your audience? How do they get their information? How do they want to get their information? You know, when I'm out and I'm running out in the park, whatever, I'm doing all that uh, at four in the morning and I am uh, uh, listening to podcasts, things that I've downloaded, things that I've, I've, I've you know, the night before, because that's the only time I have to get my information, right? And I'll, the podcasts I'll listen to are the ones that are updated at midnight or 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. So yeah, definitely. Understand your audience and understand how they like to work. There are also workshops in uh, different innovation networks that you can access in order to try to build some of the skill sets that you don't have uh, in various cities around Australia. But also, um, I think I might have some insight here because, um, you know, the company that I run, it's a chemical engineering, process engineering and geology company, and I'm none of those things. Right. And um, so I think it's building out teams where other people have the skill sets that you don't, because you're never going to know everything. Uh, so, and having teams with, um, with a diversity of background and approaches it, um, is only going to help the robustness of your business and the way that you can um, respond to different challenges over time. And I can tell you that I know absolutely nothing that uh, I know nothing at all that um that sophia knows not a damn thing and I, i'm fascinated <laughs> by what you do but could not even tell you in a million years what it is <laughs> but, 
Um, so I think we've, we've got five more minutes to go. So we might just do um, one last poll and then I have some closing remarks. And the last poll is about diversity and your business. So in your startup planning, how much consideration have you given to building a diverse and inclusive business environment? And the answers are, it's a key priority. It's important. I haven't planned for that far ahead or it's not a major consideration for me. And it, it's, a, um, it's anonymous, so we, we won't judge you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You know, one of the things that, that I find fascinating um, is that you, 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 I think the smartest people I've ever met understand that they're, they're building diverse teams, not just because it, it looks good, but they're building diverse teams because the knowledge that they're going to get from a diverse team is so much more. You know, one of the things that drove me crazy about, um, if you look at politicians or whatever, they, they, they take class photos, right? So it's, it's the politician and all of their um, support staff. So everyone from their admins to their interns to the people. And if they all look, if they all look the same color, right? Or they're all the same gender, you have to ask stuff look at their audience, look at the people, look at their, look at their constituents. How are they, how much are they really catering to their constituents if everyone looks like them? Right. And I ask that all the time, how much, you know, how much can a company really know about people if everyone who works for them looks like them right? or looks the same or acts the same. And that's the other aspect of that is that we have to start looking at neurodiversity as a resource as well. It's not just skin color, sexual orientation, uh, gender, it's different brains. That's important too. You know, Goldman Sachs made an announcement about that this year, that they would no longer invest in any company that doesn't have a female member of their board or, or chair. Yeah. Um, because they said that there is no way with the amount of talent with um, diversity in the workforce that if you if you're a company that doesn't have diversity on your board with regard to female um, representation, you have not done the right amount of searching. And there, there are, um, they made a statement about the um, performance metrics, which was in the like diverse teams perform more than 50% better than, um, nope, than others. Yeah. I mean, it's, but Goldman Sachs is making these statements, right? So um, it, there's, there's a change. Something. Great. Um, Peter, I would um, invite you to um, make any closing remarks you might have, um, particularly, um, we would love to uh, host you next time. Um, I know that it's a, a very long flight and everything, but um, we are missing a little bit of face-to-face -face interaction, but. Um, well, next time I have a book to write, I'll definitely make the trip. I think that, you know, one of the things I loved about my last time I was there is I did, the, again, the diverse number of people that I met and just how much fun I had um, uh, meeting new people. The only downside was I started in the South and went to the, or started in the North and went to the South, which I, in my brain was like, oh great, it'll go from colder to warmer and it totally forgot to the other end of the world and wound up freezing my butt off by the time it was over. But I, I would <laughs> welcome the opportunity to come back and I'd welcome the opportunity to keep the conversation going. Anyone, again, at Peter Shankman, my email is peteranshankman.com. I am eternally grateful to, to the State Department, um, and uh, the embassy in, in Canberra for inviting me uh, to speak again. It, it, it always tells me when I get re-invited, it means I did a good job the first time, which, you know, when you have imposter syndrome is, 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 is always tough. And I guess the last thing I would suggest is, um, you know, it is an interesting time and we are all in a very interesting place. And that being said, the, as interesting as it is, it also has the ability to wreak havoc on ourselves mentally. And it is just ridiculously important that we take care of ourselves and that if we feel like it's a little too much, we talk to someone, right? Uh, you know, entrepreneurship is hard and can be very lonely and throw in a pandemic and it gets even lonelier. Make sure you have a circle, make sure you have people to talk to, make sure you're taking care of yourself physically, you're working out, you're exercising, you're drinking water, eating a vegetable every once in a while, things like that. You know, those things are important and, and the only way you can truly su succeed as an entrepreneur is if you're taking care of yourself first. So I, I like to close on that because that's just uh, just something I, I really believe in is ridiculously important. Thank you very much, Peter Shankman. This has been just a pleasure to have this chat. We will endeavor to in answer any questions we didn't get to online. Thank you for joining us for the Diplomacy Delivered series and we'll catch you next time. Bye. <laughs>